actually not a big TV watcher. In fact, I, if I'm being honest, I go most of the year without ever turning the television on. Now that is not to say that I do not consume media. I am as guilty as the rest of us. I'm a big podcast listener. I listen to books on audio. I do lots of internet searches and YouTube videos, and I definitely consume information and entertainment, but just not usually through television except there are a couple of things that can pull me out of my television fast, okay? One of them is holiday programming. I am a sucker for the Hallmark Channel and for all of the fun Christmas programming. I will definitely turn on the television for a season of Gilmore Girls in around the holidays, so definitely love that. And then I love legal and government dramas like uh, Madam Secretary and Suits and Designated Survivor and shows like that. I, I don't know what to tell you. Don't judge me. I'm just kind of a sucker for legal dramas, people that can keep the letter of the law and still abide within the limitations of the law. But long before Hollywood was entertaining all of us with dramas like those on television, the Israelites were living out their own own drama and saga with the law of God, okay? They were navigating the law and they were experiencing some of the same types of pot, plot twists and dramas that we see in modern day television shows of such nature. Now, by the time we reach Luke chapter six in scripture, for all intents and purposes, it is safe to say Israel has failed at keeping the law, okay? They are surviving by a remnant at this point, and that is not because they were able to navigate the law. It is because God in his steadfast love and mercy has preserved them. But really, the law had met its end with the Israelites. Northern Israel was all but annihilated and scattered. And then Judah, southern Israel, has been exiled and taken into captivity. And then there's been 400 years of silence. And here we find ourselves with those that remain, the remnant of the Jews, many of them are are trying to be diligent at keeping the law because they have seen what happens, okay? And not only are they themselves being diligent at trying to keep the law, they are diligent at policing others trying to keep the law. So read with me in chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. On a Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, what are you doing? Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on a Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate of the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And also he gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, the son of man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Now, as is often the case, I'm not sure that this resonates or lands on our ears the way it would have the original audience, okay? So first, let me say this. Jesus is not breaking the law, okay? He is the son of God. He knew the law and he was not breaking the law. And it is very audacious for these Pharisees to question and try to police the giver of the law. So there, there's two things at play here, okay? The first is that you have to understand the Pharisees have added things to the law, okay? They think they are protecting it. And listen, this still happens today. Maybe you've heard someone say something to the effect of, well, scripture says this, but we're going to err on the side of caution and we're gonna draw our line back here. We're going to just protect the law a little bit. Oral tradition of the Jews tells us that this was regarded as drawing a fence 
around the law in the time of the Pharisees. So I want you to picture with me what is at play here. You have the law. Let's say it's set up as center. Here is the principle that God himself has set forward. And then you see these Jews, these people that are trying to protect it. So rather than being able to come up near the law, they are going to put a fence all the way around this law. Now, what happens in that in-between space? You see, this is what God has said. And this space around here is what the Pharisees have said. So who is moderating that? Bingo, the Pharisees are. This was about power. It gave them power to be the mediators of the law. Now, the second thing that's at play in this particular passage in Scripture is that the Pharisees have failed to recognize the authorship of the law. When Jesus says here in verse 5, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath, he is saying to them, I am the Messiah. I am the Lord over this and every law. And so what we see playing out in these first five verses of Luke chapter six is prophecy that is continuing to unfold. We've talked about this before in our study, that so much of the prophetic words of Isaiah and other prophets from the Old Testament do play themselves out. They have their fulfillment here in the New Testament. And we see that Isaiah 53 actually foretells that the Messiah will be despised and rejected by men. Make no mistake, these Pharisees despised Jesus. And they only despised him more when Jesus performs another miracle again on the Sabbath. We'll read in verses 6 through 11 that Jesus heals a man with a withered hand. Now listen, what we are seeing is that Jesus is going right inside those fenced-in areas of the law, and he's not apologizing for it. In fact, what he's doing is he's modeling how he's going to fulfill that law, because Jesus was doing preparation work. He was doing some prep work, okay? He's fulfilling some parts of the law while also fulfilling the spirit of the law. He's keeping the law of the Sabbath. Again, make no mistake, he is not breaking the law, but he's also fulfilling the spirit of it simultaneously. And that was the part that most often tripped the Pharisees up, okay? Because they were looking to keep a checklist. They wanted to be able to say yes and no. We've done it. We've not done it. But the spirit of the law was always something more deep. It was always something that came from God himself. It was those principles of love and mercy and grace and compassion. And those are not able to be regulated through checklist. And so we see Jesus modeling for them beautifully. He's preparing a way for them to make sense of what he will do on the cross when he fulfills the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. For time's sake, though, we're going to skip past those verses and we are going to get to the next critical and crucial moment in Jesus's earthly ministry. And that is the calling of the 12 apostles. You know, we often use the word apostle and disciple interchangeably, but for clarity's sake, I'd like to draw a distinction that R.C. Sproul draws for us. Jesus had many more disciples than 12, but an apostle was one who was bathed in authority. In the ancient world, an apostolos was one who was sent. Someone who filled that role functioned as an emissary or an ambassador or a representative of someone in a high position. So when Jesus separated 12 men and gave them apostolic authority, he was assigning to them his own authority so that when they said and what they taught carried with it the full weight of Jesus's authority. So with that in mind, let's read about these very important 
apostles. Begin with me in verse 12. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12 whom he named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. You know, for years, I've led a group on Monday during lunch that we dig into Scripture together. It's just a one-hour little class. We get together. Sometimes people bring their lunch, and we just dig into Scripture together. Just what I encourage you to do um, every time we study together. we That's my practice as well. I do that with a little group. And what we do every week when we get together is that we open up the Bible, we read a passage similar to what I would have just read, and I will then pose some form of this question. What stands out to you? Now, I know that you and I are not physically in the same space right now, but I don't have to be in the same space to know what you are likely thinking, what likely stands out to you, because it is the same thing that stands out to me. Why did Jesus call a traitor? He's Jesus. He knows. Why would he call Judas Iscariot? Here's the deal. I may not be able to answer this to your satisfaction, but I myself have wrestled with this at many points during Scripture. I mean, we've had these questions arise before. For instance, why did God allow angels to turn on him and to have a fall from grace? Why did he create Adam and Eve with the ability to sin and usher in brokenness into his perfect utopian world? Why did God harden Pharaoh's heart against his people, his consecrated people, the the Israelites. And here's the thing. There are some ways that we look at the totality of Scripture and the understanding of who God is to help us answer and wrestle through those questions. Here are a few things, some guidelines, if you will, that help me to wrestle through those questions. Maybe they will be helpful to you. The first thing that I think is important to understand is that God created everything for His glory. His glory, His omnipotence, His sovereignty is best displayed by allowing His creation to have free will. You might have heard me teach before about the meta-narrative of of Scripture. We just kind of referred to it. Uh, It's this idea that Scripture can be broken into four parts, four narratives, and those are that there is creation, okay? God created everything. He creates the garden, which is this basic utopia. It's basically when everything was as it should be. And then you see the fall when Adam and Eve sin and brokenness enters the world. We still to this day experience the reality of the fall. But amidst the fall, what we are going to see is that God still moves, God still saves, God still redeems. So you see this redemption narrative. But we, even at this moment in time, look forward to a time when Christ will return and will restore everything to its Edenic state, to how things should have been. So you have creation, you have the fall, you have redemption, and you have restoration, okay? And so the entire experience, all of the narrative that we find in Scripture is designed to glorify God, okay? But the second thing that helps me to put this into perspective when we see these conundrums in Scripture is that God works concurrently. This is the theology of concurrence, okay? And it's basically that Genesis 50 principle, okay? What man meant for evil, God meant for for good. We see that in the life and story of Joseph, okay? Now, in the case of Pharaoh and Judas, these were two evil, corrupt men, okay? They were wicked. And what we see here is that God gives them over to their wickedness. 
But God's glory was on display because he knew this, okay? In his sovereignty, in his omniscience, he knew this. And he still exercises divine judgment in allowing them to be part of these stories. And so God concurrently ordains their wicked plans to be folded in to his redemptive plans that are for our flourishing. So it's not that he has caused these evil things to happen, and it's not that he doesn't know the evilness and the the sinfulness is going to happen. It's that he understands that. He allows this free will, but he is always going to work it in to the glory of God and for the flourishing of others. Now, this sometimes seems backwards to us. There are a lot of things that we will look and say, this seems wrong. This seems broken. This seems like God is absent from here. But the theology of concurrence would tell us that God is always at work and the kingdom calendar remains unaffected by the evil plans of the enemy. Ultimately, God's narrative will prevail and redemption and restoration will take place. The third thing that I think is always important for us to understand in scripture about God is that God works consistently. Listen, if you are in Christ, if you have turned from your sin and trusted Jesus as your personal savior, then whatever has God has done in you, he has done in spite of you. Okay, understand that whatever God has done in you, he has done in spite of you. And what that means is he knows how you have sinned and he knows further how you will sin. Okay, God has always used sinful people. Yes, Judah, Judas was a traitor, but Peter was a denier. And Thomas was a questioner. And Tasha is a sinner, just like all of them. We all fall short. And that can trip us up. Listen, I understand that there are some of you that are listening to me right now who have come to know Christ or have been transformed in a church where one of your leaders had a massive, massive moral failure that that possibly disqualified them from ministry. And what I want to tell you is the consistency of God helps us to make sense of that. God has always been in the business of using flawed sinners. The work is still his, even if the vessel is tainted, okay? We live in a broken world. We are broken people. We are wretched sinners and praise God for his consistency in using us. Now, moving along in chapter six, we are going to see rich description of the ministry of Jesus. But we are going to end today with three verses that really pack a punch. You know, scholars tell us that as it relates to Jesus's earthly life, we really only know about parts and pieces of about 52 days. And that's even a misleading number because many of those days are just days that we know he was traveling en route to somewhere, okay? So it's sometimes very sparse information. And what we understand then is that the accounts we do find in scripture are just a snapshot of hundreds, maybe possibly thousands of other encounters and accounts of Jesus's earthly ministry. Okay, so read with me beginning in verse 17. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured and all the crowd sought to touch him for power came out from him and he healed them all all. Friend, this is such a powerful picture of the all-encompassing healing power of Jesus. He's not just the broken bone healer. He, he's not just the cure the paralyzed man healer. He's not just the caster out of demons. He's not just the cleanser of leprosy. He is healer of all things and all people. 
don't miss. All the crowd sought to touch him and be healed by him. How? How were they all healed? Well, not by might, not by skill, not by some magic wand that he was carrying around in his cloak. No, he healed them with his divine power. And here's what I know. Each one of us is born needing healing. We need the healing touch of Jesus. And listen, we found some good news in this passage. You might have missed over it, but let's look at what verse 17 says. He came down with them and stood on a level place. You see, these people were so desperate for the healing power, the healing touch of Jesus, and they were able to get to him because he made himself available to them. He made them himself level with them. And they aren't the only ones for whom Jesus has made himself accessible and level. Emmanuel, God with us, is still near today. In fact, the fact that we read the account of him walking this earth is proof that he has made himself accessible to us, walking among us. He came level so that you and I today could call on his name, could receive that healing touch from Jesus because of what we see here. In the Gospel of Luke, we today don't have to touch his cloak. We don't have to get near in proximity to him. We can call on his name and repent from our sins, and he will touch us. He will save us. The 19 verses that we are focusing on this week were so pivotal for Jesus as he prepared for the cross, but they are also pivotal to all of us because we are preparing for a coming advent, a coming arrival when Jesus will restore all that was lost. So dig in this week and study hard. It's worth it. 